Thursday night. And um, did you enjoy the cooking demo, those who were there? The cooking demonstration went very well. Remember, this coming Thursday, we're having another cooking demonstration. So be sure to be here on Thursday. Chris, welcome back to you. Thank you. Um, I missed Thursday last week, um, but I'm going to be watching the lecture on YouTube. So I won't miss out on the lecture. Um, all right, guys, just for those of you um, who, who don't know yet, we've got a children's program in the, in the classroom next door over there. So if you know anyone who wants to come, but also uh, is struggling with their children, they don't know what to do with their children, we've got an answer for them. We've got a little children program there as well. And it's also health orientated. So they're learning about health, they're learning about their bodies. So it's very nice. And then also, um, for those of you who don't know, the toilets are kind of like diagonally through that way. So if you go that way, there's, there's signs for the toilets there as well. So we're going to do a summary now of Thursday's lecture, and I'm going to pass to Kim for that. Thank you, Chris. Are you guys enjoying the food outside? Lovely. So Thursday night was cardiovascular health. I hope you have a little sheet like this. They're on the table outside. Who, who doesn't have Let's, um, Hugh, just help us a bit. Who doesn't have one of these sheets yet? Even if you were not here on Thursday night, it's still helpful to get a sheet and to fill in the right answers. We'll help you with the answers now. So while we're waiting, tonight is Sunday night. Then we'll be together on Monday night. We skip Tuesday night, Wednesday and Thursday we'll be back again. So four nights this week, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. So if you still need a paper, just raise your hand please. There's more on this side, maybe just get them on this side of the room. As most of you know, we are recording these lectures, and um, if you don't know yet, you can find them on YouTube. You type in Health Seminar 1, 2, 3, or 4, we've had 4 so far, and after that you write Kurt Conning, K-U-R-T, and then a separate C-O-N-N-I-N-G, Kurt Conning, this is this man over here. So it's Health Seminar 1, 2, 3, 4, Kurt Conning, and you'll find it. So health seminar number four, cardiovascular health. We have approximately, how much is that? 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels. No, this is what? It is 100,000, isn't it, Dr. Bruce? 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels in our bodies. Isn't that amazing? It has been said that our overall health depends more on the health of our vascular endothelium the inner lining of the blood vessel than any other single factor. So what is the lining of the blood vessel? It's the endothelium, eh? Healthy endothelium releases appropriate levels of, who can remember? Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the answer. We need to become aware of the factors that damage the vascular endothelium if we are to minimize cardiovascular health as we age. Things that damage the endothelium include hypertension, hyperglycemia, oxidative stress, and biochemistry, e.g. homocysteine. And then
I thought I... There's sclerosis, sorry. Oh, it's a doctor's handwriting. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Atherosclerosis may be considered... Sorry, did you ask the third one? Okay, that's oxidative stress. Stress. So it's hypertension, hyperglycemia, oxidative stress, and then biochemistry, e.g. homocysteine. Is hyper. Hyperglycemia. Okay, we're going to the next paragraph. Atherosclerosis may be considered a chronic inflammatory inflammatory condition. Ongoing unremitting infections can increase our cardiovascular risk by increasing inflammation. So Bruce said a lot about inflammation the other night, remember? Okay, atherosclerosis and consequent cardiovascular risk may be considered a two-hit process. These include endothelial damage and inflammation. To mitigate our risk greatly for advancing cardiovascular disease, we need not only create, to not only create a favorable lipid profile, but also control our what? insulin sensitivity. Our insulin sensitivity. Okay, and then the next one. Insulin resistance contributes significantly to our risk of cardiovascular event, of a cardiovascular event. So this is very important. I think if you can remember this line, insulin resistance contributes significantly to our risk of a cardiovascular event. And what is a cardiovascular event? Heart attack, stroke, those are the big ones. Okay, insulin resistance. And then finally... Eating a plant-based diet high in antioxidants, avoiding smoking, maintaining excellent glucose control, minimizing inflammation, and moderate exercise are some important ways to stay keep. Sorry, to stay healthy probably, doctor. <laughs> to stay healthy and keep your cardiovascular system healthy. The point is, those things are all important. So, friends, we, we hope that somehow, even if you can take one thing home, just one thing, and start changing one thing. Isn't it, Dr. Bruce? Don't try and change everything at once. Change one thing. One thing. And you'll see how your health will improve. So, is there anything more from us, Chris? For those of you who have, are here for the first time, let's see who's here for the first time tonight. There's a few hands. Welcome. Um, Dr. Bruce has traveled all over the world, and we're thankful that he's back in South Africa, and he's here in Westville tonight. So, Dr. Bruce, welcome, and we look forward to tonight's lecture. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's good to be back with you. Really nice to be with you again. Um, I had a bit of a moment of absentia. I forgot the cable that connects my machine to the projector. So when I got here, I thought, cable? Because I left it here every day last week, but because we had to change the venue, I, didn't, I forgot about it. Anyway, we've made a plan thanks to Kurt. It's now on a PC. So I'm hoping all the slides are going to transfer to right. Um, tonight's another topic. Is this thing too loud? Sounds a bit loud. Okay. Nutrition and health. And Sorry, it wasn't me. <laughs> I hope. Um, right, B. Let's go back to that. So the question of nutrition is, what shall we eat? Um, what shall we eat? And I'm hoping by the end of the lecture that you might start to agree with me that what's in that last the better way to go. Um, that's what a lot of us are eating and uh, really enjoying it in the short term. We end up looking and, f looking and feeling like that. I think we've all felt like that, haven't we? Unfortunately, I, I must confess that I have. Um, and what do you notice about this guy? He's all blotter, he's 
probably got dark circles under his eyes. He's got a rather pendulous abdomen. Um, and he's not holding broccoli. There's some green there, but how long it was out of the ground, I don't know. Um, and that probably isn't carrot juice. <laughs> this guy has a similar problem. And what is the problem with this guy? Besides the fact he looks like he ran into a bus. <laughs> what, what's the problem with him? Yeah, he's insulin resistant. Because of what? Why do you say that? Because he's got... His abdominal girth is the widest part of his body. He looks like a sausage roll on steroids. So, clearly that's not healthy. Doctors are always working to preserve our health and cooks to destroy it. But the latter are often more successful. You know, when, when we started this series, um, I tried to highlight that there's some factors in our health that are more important than others. There's some factors that hold more weight, that give you more bang for your buck, and nutrition is the first one of those. So if you want to, we're looking at a whole composite array of health factors in, this, in these seminars. But if you really want to focus limited energy on a few key areas, one of the first ones to focus on is nutrition. Um, I think it's the well-known athletic brands, without mentioning names again. It says their slogan is what? It's what you put in, isn't it? You know that one? It's what you put in. So true. So hopefully we, we're not going to look like that last bulldog, but, but more like this chap. Is, and not for the sake of looking nice, although it's nice to have a good body, good physique, but what that actually represents in your physiology when you start to look like that. Um, so nutrition is a big subject. Can you see all right? Sorry. Is that all right? Nutrition is a big subject, and it's an emotional one. If you want to upset people easily, you take something off their fork, isn't it? Yeah. It's a very emotional subject. Why do we eat? We eat because we're hungry, hopefully. That's one of the better reasons to eat. Um, for enjoyment, and I believe we're meant to enjoy eating. We have a very sophisticated nervous system that helps us enjoy our food. Our taste system is extremely well developed. You know that most of your tastes are smells, you know that which is why if you've got a blocked nose, you don't taste your food too well, because most of what you're tasting is, is smell. Um, <clears throat> but we meant to enjoy our food. We designed for it. Our physiology tells us that. So don't feel bad enjoying food. What you must feel bad about is enjoying the wrong food. Does that make sense? So um, socially, we eat for social reasons. We eat out of habit, because it's now lunchtime. We eat because we're addicted to certain foods. And that's one we need to focus a bit more on as well. Um, and we eat for health, hopefully. This is, this is what I want to try and encourage all of us to, is to eat intentionally. Remember that word we first used right in the beginning? We spoke about intentionality. And we need to start becoming intelligent about what we want for our health and our lives and then start making deliberate choices. It doesn't happen by accident. Left to our own devices, we'll choose chocolate cake every time, won't we? It's, that's how we are, once we go down that, that route. So we eat to repair and replace worn-out tissue to provide a fuel source for our cells and nutrients to run the system. I mean, those sound really obvious, but there's some of the reasons we eat, and those are some of the reasons, some of those in there we should be re using for, for eating. So Hippocrates, this is a well-known saying, he said, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. And that was said by Hippocrates, who didn't live 10 years ago. He was the Greek philosopher, the father of medicine. If, and I want to ask you a question. Sorry, I'm having lots of spelling things today. I did a lot of stuff in a rush, my apologies. Is your, is your, your food... No, if your, sorry, that's right. If your food is your medicine, will you get well? With what you, with, no, with what you're currently eating. If your food now is your medicine, will you get well? Great. <laughs> it's just something personal to reflect on. Think about the last 48 hours. What was on the fork? Bill Cosby said, I am what I ate and I'm afraid. <laughs> this is beautiful, isn't it? Um, I think that's, that must be Switzerland. Switzerland's a beautiful country. It's really lovely. But why I put this slide up is that we need to change the way we see eating, what eating actually is. 
Food is actually information. Did you know that? Food is information. Um, so the question you need to ask is, I mean, we've got this beautiful environment around us. We've got good things in the environment and we've got bad things in the environment. And eating is the process of incorporating that environment into your body. In a sense, that's what you're doing. So now I'm getting rather philosophical about eating, but if you think about it this way, um, you've got to ask what part of the environment that's been provided is going to give me the best health outcomes because you're incorporating part of that environment into your physiology. Does that, does that make sense? So, eating is interacting with the external world because we said that the gut is the lumen is still outside the body, but the food that you're putting in is information. And so there's, there's stuff in our external world which is clearly good and stuff which is clearly bad. So, what part of the external environment are you making use of? And the question is, because if food is information, which I, I believe it is, that information is giving a message to your cells and to your genes. So, one of the biggest points of interaction between us and the external environment is our food. And so your cells are reading what you internalizing. It'll make you think differently about that chocolate cake, wouldn't it? Your cell, so the question I'm asking is, what information are your cells and genes reading? What part of the external environment are you incorporating? It might change the way we think about food, isn't it? So when next when you see a nice, beautiful vegetable garden, you can say, well, that looks like the environment I want to internalize. Because you're going to give, that's information that you're giving your cells and your genes. I was very tempted to bring a well-known burger with me tonight and hold it up next to some broccoli. I didn't, but you probably would have gone for the smell of the burger, I'm sure. But um, food, food is information. So what shall we eat? And, and I like this, eat a live frog every morning and nothing worse will happen to you. That was Mark Twain. <laughs> so what shall we eat? And I, I suspect that many of you have come because nutrition today is a very contentious issue. We, science is trying to answer this question and it's an evolving process, isn't it? We've got people saying that were actually part of my, um, my lecture, the lectures that I was exposed to at Varsity, that used to say one thing and then are saying fundamentally different things now. So science is evolving in terms of nutritional science, uh, nutrition. And um, my personal conviction is that when we approach this subject, like any other with the human body, we need to do so with great humility because we're still learning. Um, but once we start to understand what, we comp what our bodies are made of, what they require for good physiology, we can start to make more intelligent choices. And hopefully that's what tonight will empower you with to some degree. So this is a picture of a kidney. No, it's a brain, isn't it? So that's a frontal lobe, that's a parietal lobe, that's a occipital lobe, cerebellum and temporal lobe. It's been said that if you eat for your brain, you will provide what the rest of your body needs. In other words, if you know what your brain needs to be healthy, you, the rest of you will be all right if you do those things. So that sounds like something useful to focus on, isn't it? So we must know what brain, what brain requirements are. Just to emphasize that the things that we put into our body, the brain physiology, um, works based on the raw materials we're putting in. So one of the key nutrients that the brain uses to operate is neurotransmitters. And, and the precursors of neurotransmitters are what? There's about 50 different neurotransmitters. Did you know that? What are some of the main neurotransmitters? Does anybody not know what a neurotransmitter is? Yeah, acetylcholine is one. So does anybody not know what a neurotransmitter is? Sorry. Neurotransmitter, basically, every organ has a functional unit that makes it work at its simplest level. The functional unit of the, the nervous system in the brain is the synapse. And it consists of where, it's a region where two neurons come together. And you've got an electrical signal converting to a chemical signal, which then converts to an electrical signal. So it's electrical, chemical, electrical. And so the signal gets perpetuated and goes along all the circuitry. It's like electrical wiring. And the way that the brain uses to jump between the two synapses 
or be between the two neurons is, are chemicals called neurotransmitters. So it's the way the brain's using to convert a chemical, an electrical signal to chemical to electrical. So those compounds or those, those things are called neurotransmitters. What are some of the common neurotransmitters? You all know them. We've had one, acetylcholine. Let's just go back quickly. Just, I think this is useful to understand. What's the main neurotransmitter in the frontal lobe? Anyone? You know it. Don't be shy. <laughs> Dopamine, yeah. Dopamine's the main neurotransmitter in the frontal lobe. And that's, if your frontal lobe's working properly, if you've got healthy levels of dopamine, um, you'll be alert. You can interact well. If, you, if, you've had a lot of, if you've had drugs and alcohol and sugar, you suppress your frontal lobe activity. Depression is associated with decreased frontal lobe function. So it's a frontal lobe suppressed... Frontal lobe suppression will put you at risk of depression. The parietal lobe, what's the main neurotransmitter there? Anybody know? No? That's in the occipital lobe. Acetylcholine is the main neurotransmitter in the parietal lobe. And the temporal lobe is a neurotransmitter called GABA. Anybody, everybody heard of GABA? Gamma and butyric acids, it's a nice relaxing neurotransmitter. So when you're short on GABA, you can be anxious. So if you have a lot of anxiety, you can be GABA deficient. So your emotional state tells you about the function of your brain. And the whole point of this series is to emphasize that your brain is indicating what's happening in the rest of your physiology. If you've had a bad reaction in your gut, your brain will be upset because it'll be inflamed. If you've had a bad um, hypoglycemic episode if you're diabetic or if you've just eaten, planned your meals poorly, your brain function will be upset. So your brain is a barometer of what's happening in the rest of your body. So what's affecting the rest of your physiology is going to manifest as brain symptoms. So how are you feeling right now? Exactly right now. How I'm feeling is very much dependent on the, the net balance of my neurotransmitters, of my neurochemistry. So it makes sense that we start to understand the factors that are affecting the brain physiology to optimize those things because the balance of that neurochemistry is affecting your feeling, affecting your clarity, your cognitive state, your mental, your mental acuity. And that's powerful. So those, those neurotransmitters are interacting. Um, the main ones are noradrenaline, uh, dopamine, serotonin, you can't see at the bottom here, but those are three of the main ones that interact. Um, serotonin you to sleep nicely at night. If you're not sleeping well, you can have imbalances in your serotonin. Serotonin is made from an amino acid, which we'll see later, called tryptophan, but we'll get into that now. So, just to emphasize the point further, if you have anxiety, um, I don't want to overfocus on supplements now, but things like GABA can be deficient, serotonin can be deficient, sugar, sugar dysregulation, if you're having poor blood sugar control, that affects the stability of your brain function. If you're having food allergies, that can affect the stability of your brain physiology. Um, if you have hormonal dysregulation, which we spoke of the other night, that affects the stability of your brain function. If you have um, toxins like heavy metals, that can affect your brain physiology. Um, stress. So many things. What do our cells need to be healthy? We're talking about nutrition tonight. If we need to know what to put in, we need to know what the cells need. Is that a logical question? So. Amino acids from proteins. Why does your body need amino acids? Because you need to rebuild and repair tissue. Constantly breaking down tissue. As you're sitting now, you're sloughing off cells. Um, your hair's growing. You know, your gastrointestinal lining is sloughing off. Um, you're losing tissue, yeah, and tissue needs to be repaired. And so you need amino acids or the building blocks of tissue. Um, so the, the protein found in bone, for instance, is called osteocalcin. Um, it's made up of amino acids. So you need structural matrix to support the body tissue. And that's the amino acids. You need fats, essential fats. Where, that, where are the fats particularly important? It's the cell membrane, isn't it? So cell membranes are large. It's a phospholipid membrane made up of healthy fats, hopefully. And fats also form hormones. What's a classical hormone? That's formed from fats. The steroid hormones in your adrenal glands, isn't it? Progesterone, yes. Progesterone is a steroid hormone, which is a cholesterol base. Progesterone is made from pregnenolone, which is made from cholesterol. So you get steroid hormones, which are fat-based. 
You also get protein hormones like growth hormone, which is a sequence of amino acids. Um, you need a fuel source. So now you've got these cells, you've got the structure for your cells, but you need to run them. You need some, an energy currency. So your body uses uh, compounds like glucose to make ATP. Everybody know what ATP is? ATP is the fuel source that your cells run on. And it's made in little organelles called mitochondria. The mitochondria. So basically what happens, and it's an amazing design. It's an incredible design. The sunlight shines on what? Green plants. So this is the energy cycle. Sunlight shines, the UV light shines on green plants. That green plant combines carbon dioxide, water, and the energy from the sun to make what? Glucose. Which is, so it's, remember that from high school days, 6O2 plus 6CO2 equals C6H12O6 plus 6CO2. So, <laughs> well, that's what's happening. So basically, it's, it's clever. It's, it's taking the carbon dioxide you and I are breathing out. Sorry, I got it the wrong way around. It's, it's taking CO2, it's taking the carbon dioxide we breathe out, right, plus the water, and combining the two to form the glucose, right, and breathing out oxygen. That's in the day. At night, the, the plant also uses carbon dioxide. It also produces carbon dioxide. So anyway, that, that sunlight is trapped in the bonds of the glucose molecule. And all that's happening in our physiology is that 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 trapped sunlight energy is being handed down and shuttled down, and when those bonds are broken, it releases <coughs> ATP, ultimately. So that's energy metabolism in a nutshell. Um, so we are solar-powered. We run on sun energy. Um, we really are. Um, we need vitamins and minerals for our biochemistry. We need water. We need antioxidants for protection. And we need oxygen. Um, so, about that. Nutrition and your brain. Ultimately, as, we've, as we keep saying, if we need to feel well, we need to be well at a brain level. And we need to have, be making those choices that, and be aware of the things that are negatively affecting our, the capacity of our brain to work well. So, we're trying to get really practical tonight. What affects our, the function of our brain? Junk food, red meat. We'll see what red meat does to your brain a bit later. Um, excessive refined foods inhibit optimal brain function. Sugar inhibits peak mental performance. Why does sugar do that? One of, the, one of the reasons. Anybody have a suggestion? Have a shot at it. <laughs> so it causes dysregulation, isn't it? So it's causing... The, sugar is a refined carbohydrate. And one of the things you can categorically walk away with is that if you could avoid sugar for the rest of your life, you'd have done yourself a huge favor. Sugar is poison. It doesn't belong in the body. Sugar, refined sugar. So, no, you don't need sugar. Not, not the white stuff that you take out of a packet. Carbohydrate. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But the more, more refined, the, more refined the, the sugar, the worse it is for you. And the reason for that is that it's, it's lost the nutrients that it came with in the plant to aid its own metabolism. So when you take that sugar, it goes straight into your bloodstream and causes what? An insulin spike. And then the body often overcompensates and your blood sugar is going up and down. So somebody, especially kids, well often kids, if they're on lots of sugar, their moods and their, their emotional state fluctuates with the stuff that you're feeding them. So if you want a nightmare at home, feed your kids sweets. You're going to cause dysregulation in their sugar and you're going to affect their frontal lobe function. You want stable kids, give them stable food. It's that, it's that important. We often use sugar and caffeine as self-medication. Um, what do we do when we feel bad? And I'm as guilty as the next person. You go home and you have a bag of chocolate brownies or something. Why, why do we do that? Because those things temporarily, temporarily raise our serotonin and dopamine. And we feel good momentarily, but then we crash because it doesn't sustain. So we need to be making choices that keeps those neurotransmitter levels at an optimal level. Um, so tryptophan and tyrosine, those are two amino acids, very important amino acids. Um, tryptophan is the precursor of which neurotransmitter? 
serotonin. We spoke about it just now. So serotonin in your diet is converted to, trip, to sorry, tryptophan is converted to serotonin and tyrosine to dopamine. Yeah, so tyrosine potentially can help stabilize your dopamine levels in your frontal lobe. Now, these amino acids, where are they found? They're found in our foods. So the best sources of them, they occur in animal products. Of course they do. But they also occur in plant products. And one of the reasons that getting them from plant sources is better is because plant foods come with, um, with carbohydrate intact. And to get these amino acids into your brain to make the neurotransmitters, it's an insulin-mediated mechanism, which means you need a little bit of carbohydrate present to get that neurotransmitter across your blood-brain barrier into your brain where it makes the neurotransmitters. So if you get it from a protein source, proteins are often devoid of carbohydrate, and therefore you don't get the amino acid, even though they can be a good source of the amino acid. You don't absorb them as well because it's an insulin-driven mechanism. Does that make sense? So taking an amino acid with a little bit, uh, if one were to, I'm not, depression's not this simple, so don't see it as that. But if you're taking tryptophan or, or 5-HTP, which is a tryptophan product, to um, aid your serotonin, then it makes sense to have it with a little bit of a piece of banana or something like that that's, that's going to aid the tryptophan absorption. Um, <clears throat> so the point is, the amino acids that we put into our system are affecting our brain chemistry. And it's better to get them from a plant-based source because the plants come with the carbohydrate needed to get them into the brain. Make sense? Even though sometimes some of the animal products have even higher levels, they're not always getting into the brain. So some good sources of tryptophan, pumpkin seeds, seaweed. Doesn't sound very appealing, does it? But people are eating seaweed more and more these days. Um, chia seeds, sesame, tofu, oats are rich in tryptophan. These things, so this is just trying to show you the, that what's on your plate is affecting how your brain's functioning. Um, Lentils is one of the highest sources of tyrosine. Um, tofu, wheat germ, peaches, and watermelon also contain tyrosine. So when you, when's a good time to eat watermelon? is in the morning, because it's tyrosine-rich, and it helps to boost your dopamine. So if you want to get alert, have some watermelon in the morning with your, before your, for your breakfast. Um, the way that the degree to which these amino acids are transported into your brain uh, depends on the other amino acids that are in the food they come with. So LNAA stands for large neutral amino acids. If the diet, um, if the food you're taking to get your amino acids is high in these other amino acids, they compete, they use the same mechanism to get into the brain. So the more of these long, large neutral amino acids there are, um, the more they're competing with the tryptophan and the tyrosine to get into your brain. So the food, the way, the amount, the amount of these amino acids that are into your brain depends on the food you're taking them with and the amount of competing amino acids. Um, so that's something that's quite important to bear in mind. <clears throat> Omega-3 fats. So we've said that you're, to function well, you, your brain needs um, amino acids. Importantly, things like tryptophan and tyrosine are two of the important ones. Um, Omega-3 fats are just really, really important. And they're considered essential fatty acids um, because we can't make them. Essential means we can't make them. They have to be derived in the diet. Um, deficiency of omega-3s is one of the most common contributing factors to mental health issues. That's profound, eh? So if you're suffering with depression or anxiety states, um, there's actually a test you can do in South Africa called an omega quant. It can give you an idea about how much, what your omega-3 status is. And I, and I think, you know, while we're on this, mental illness and mental dis-ease is absolutely rough these days. And the, the point I want to make is your brain is a physiological organ. You, you can't always feel when your pancreas is not happy. You can't always feel when your liver's not happy. But your brain's an organ like any of those things, a very complex one, and ultimately the most important one. But it can give you some symptoms. So you need to understand when you're, when you're feeling a certain thing that your brain is telling you something. And you need to, we need to be cognizant of that and say, listen, well, what is it telling me and how do I change that? Um, and the point that I'm trying to make here is that its function is made up of the things that we're putting in to a large degree. 
What we're putting in is affecting how you think and how you feel. Um, and the, the omega-3 fats and their deficiencies are, are critical in, in mental health issues these days. So it's important to get the right balance of those. I've, I've seen children that have been very challenging, let's put it that way, to deal with, that put on omega-3s, you can turn a lot of them around. It's not the only factor, but it's a very important factor. Um, because this fat helps to form the membranes of the neurons. So the phospholipid membrane is designed to be fluid. And these, these omega-3s are called PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and they help to keep the membrane nice and flexible. And flexible neurons are happy neurons. And if, what does hydrogenated, hydrogenated fats do? When you eat hydrogenated fats in the form of margarine, um, your body actually takes those man-adulterated fats and puts them into the membranes. And they become more stiff and less happy neurons. So if you want happy neurons, you want flexible membranes. And to get flexible membranes, you need essential fatty acids. Um, so it affects the function of 23 genes in the hippocampus, the omega-3 fats. It increases a, a compound called transthyretin, or transthyretin. That actually scavenges beta amyloid protein. So anybody know what beta amyloid protein does? Beta amyloid protein is one of the proteins that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease. So when we get older, we need to make sure that our elderly folks are getting enough omega-3s. And we'll see there's many other nutrients we need to make, make sure they get optimal level of, levels of. The thing that's profound for me is that a lot of what we consider as inevitable parts of aging is not. It's, it's, a, process, it's a function of and what we're not giving the body. And so there's, there's literally old people sitting in old age homes that are demented that may not need to be. And, and that's profound. Um, we're not made to get dementia. And there are many reasons for dementia. But there are many simple reasons for dementia. And this, this is why we must use this information. Um, a ratio, you know, the ratio with the omega-6 is important. So there's omega-3 fatty acids and there's omega-6 fatty acids. And most of us are getting more than enough omega-6s. Things like sunflower oil is quite rich in omega-6. And omega-6s tend to be pro-inflammatory. They tend to exacerbate inflammation in the body. And omega-3s tend to settle inflammation in the body. They're anti-inflammatory. So we need to increase the proportion of our omega-3s in our diet. Most of us are sitting with a ratio of omega-3 omega of about 20 to 1. We need to improve the ratio down to about 4 to 1, ideally. Um, and as I said, where needed, not for everybody, you can test for your level of omega-3s. But the ideal is to get it from your diet. Use diet, manipulate your diet before you grab a supplement. There's place for supplements, and we'll look at some of that. Yeah, we, we can talk about, we'll take questions a bit later. That's fine. Thank you. But, but the most important ones are the omega-3s. Most important are the omega-3s. Um, so the, the commonest source of these omega-3s, everybody says, is fish, right? So we, you can get omega-3s from, from fish, um, especially the things like salmon and herring, mackerel. Those fish are quite high in omega-3s. But what's the problem? Where do the fish get the omega-3? Do they make it? Do you know where fish get the omega-3 from? Yeah. They get it from seaweed and phytoplankton. So you're basically eating, again, second-hand nutrients. The fish don't make omega-3. They're, it's essential for them as well. The problem with eating and getting your omega-3s from fish is that we're getting the stuff that comes with the fish, which is mercury and toxins. So maybe 100 years ago, um, fish used to be a very good source of omega-3, and it still is, but it comes with these added problems now related to 21st century living. So um, fish is no longer, in my opinion, the best source of omega-3. It's a good source of it, but the fish are getting it from where you can get it from. If the fish can get it from an, a vegetarian source, then so can you. And there's actually vegetarian EPA and DHA now that you can get. And because of these problems associated with eating fish, um, it's better to get it from a plant-based source. So you get vegan EPA and vegan DHA. Um, and we'll look at ALA as well. Um, so plant sources. So, so mercury is a problem with fish. Biomagnification is where one fish eats another fish and it gets accelerated in their tissues and gets amplified. Um, 
Plant sources are spinach, green soybeans, wheat germ, black walnut, flax seed, and chia seeds. Those are plant sources of omega-3s. Coconut oil, Coconut oil no. Coconut oil doesn't have it. No. Uh, flax, if you want to make a really good spread for your toast or something in the morning, take, take a quarter. And this information I took from a book called, just to give credit where it's due, it's called, um, it'll come to me. It's a guy by the name of Neil Nedley, Dr. Neil Nedley, and sorry, his name, his title escapes me. So, but this, this nut spread is, is a very good way to start your day. Uh, a quarter ground walnuts, which is rich in omega-3, quarter flax meal, salt, and some honey. Make a spread out of it and put it on your toast or whatever you're having um, with it. Um, it's very rich in omega-3 um, from a plant source. There was a study, a book written called The Blue Zones. Everybody, anybody heard about it? It's a guy by the name of uh, Dan Bugner, I think it is. Dan Bugner. Um, but basically looked at where people are living the longest on the planet. Who has the longest lifespan? And it was three places. The Okinawans, um, the Sardinians, and um, a group in California. At Loma Linda, yeah. That's right. And these people had the longest lifespans. And um, so th that's what the study looked at. The group in California, their longevity is still improving. The, the, these are non-fish eating vegetarians. They live the longest and have the least heart disease. And they are non-fish eating vegetarian. Um, and this is important. So the essential fatty acids that there are, in plants, what, what is the one that occurs in plants? Does anybody know? It's ALA, isn't it? Alpha-linolenic acid. So the three names to remember are ALA, EPA, and DHA. ALA, EPA, and DHA. So ALA in vegetarians can be converted to EPA and DHA. In most people, this conversion, because the, the really active essential fatty acid in your brain is DHA. That's the one that really has the most benefit in the brain. Um, and, and EPA is converted to DHA. So your body, if you, if you didn't have any animal source of essential fatty acid, your body can convert it from ALA if you're having flaxseed, for instance. That conversion doesn't happen very well in most people, but they found it happens better in people that are exclusively vegetarian. So it's basically like DHA is the end product, ALA is the starting product, is an assembly line, if you're, starting, if you're taking DHA as the end product, then the body doesn't convert the other stuff to that efficiently. Does that make sense? It's almost like it's the same as if you take melatonin. Um, the body works on negative feedback things. So if you take an end product, the, precursors, the precursor conversions don't always work so well. Does that make sense? So tryptophan becomes... The, bo the body's designed for balance. So if you increase one thing, you pay the price somewhere else. So you, you, you must remember that when you're supplementing is that if you put something in, it's often an end product. It's going to affect the function of the precursors sometimes. And one of the things I believe is may fall into that category is something like melatonin. Your body makes melatonin from what? Well, you've got tryptophan, which goes to serotonin, right? Well, tryptophan goes to 5-HTP to serotonin. Serotonin becomes melatonin. So uh, if you take melatonin, then you can potentially block off the production of your serotonin or decrease the serotonin potentially based on that mechanism. Does that make sense? So it's the same with EPA and DHA. So if you're exclusively vegetarian, your body can upregulate your capacity to convert ALA into EPA and DHA. Now, many people are still taking their essential fatty acids from fish oils. And as I said, the, that's one way of getting it. But the problems with that are the mercury and the, the toxins that come with that. So... I think it's a better idea to try and get your essential fatty acids from plant-based sources of EPA and DHA. Uh, so firstly, get them from your diet. by using the appropriate seeds like flaxseed and things which we're looking at, walnuts. Um, but if you are deficient and if you have a mental health condition and you think you need more, I think it's a good idea to get it from a vegetarian source of EPA and DHA. Um, everybody with me on that? The room's very quiet. I'll put you all to sleep. I hope not. Um, so, omega-3s in plant foods, 
chia seeds, kiwi, flax seed, walnuts, canola oil. Um, and that was just showing that the, how poor the conversion can be um, in men. ALA to EPA, 2.8%. In women, 21%. They think that estrogen improves women's capacity to actually convert the ALA into EPA and DHA. So they have an advantage. But these poor figures, were act this study was actually done on people that were eating fish as well. So that, you know, gives us some reassurance that even though it was so poor, this was on people that were eating fish. So that just makes the same point. Other important brain nutrients to consider. Your brain needs B1, B6. Uh, B6 helps with homocysteine control. Folate, B12. Up to 25% of dementia cases um, in old age homes can be related to something as simple as B12, B12 deficiency. And you must remember, as you get older, your capacity to absorb B12 decreases. Your intestinal absorption of B12 is not as efficient. Um, so it's really one of those nutrients you want to be supplementing with as you get older, um, vitamin B12. Um, a form called hydroxocobalamin is the best form. Vitamin B12 comes in a number of different forms. It comes in cyanocobalamin, uh, methylcobalamin, and hydroxocobalamin. And um, it's something to keep in optimal levels. And, and one of the ways to test is to, at least every five years, test your folate levels and your B12, plus your homocysteine, your cholesterol, and your triglycerides. Um, your homocysteine level is going to tell you how well your methylation cycle is working. And the folate and B12 fundamentally affect the function of your homocysteine. So those are things to keep tabs on with your GP and your, your doctor that you're working with. Um, Estadenosyl methionine, you might remember that, that methylation cycle I showed you the other night. If you want to keep your... So where are we now, just to summarize? We've got structural requirements. The brain needs essential fatty acids. Your body needs essential fatty acids. The brain needs amino acids to make neurotransmitters. Um, and it needs vitamins and minerals to run, and it needs a fuel source. Um, so these are the, the vitamins and minerals that help your cycles, your biochemistry run well. So if you are deficient, if you've got some of those SNPs we spoke about, those genetic polymorphisms, remember we said some of us inherit those, those little uh, genetic mutations that control how your body um, activates certain vitamins, for instance, like um, normal folate in your diet to methyl folate, they can affect... Um, the turning of these brain cycles, these body cycles, and hence your cognitive function, which is quite profound. So simple things like folate deficiency, B12 deficiency, can fundamentally affect um, our risk of dementias um, and things like that, which is really important. And they're simple to test. This is a readily available test. It's not rocket science. Um, so is the is the is one of the main methylators of the body. It's one of the main methyl donors. So we've said that the process in your body, one of them that's really important to keep optim optimally functioning is the process of methylation. And methylation is just where the body, don the, the compounds, the chemistry donates methyl groups to other chemical compounds, activates genes, switches on genes, switches off genes. The main methylator, one of the main methylators is s methionine, And that actually provides the final impetus to producing a lot of your neurotransmitters. Um, choline, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, um, Against, vitamin E protects against cognitive decline. Vitamin K, we spoke about the other night. Vitamin K is also important. Iron, selenium, resveratrol, BDNF. Um, BDNF is brain-derived neurotropic factor. That's basically like fertilizer for your brain. Um, and when you, when you exercise, you boost... So, so there's certain things that boost this brain growth factor called BDNF. So if you go for good regular exercise, you're boosting your BDNF. Um, if you do intermittent fasting, if you fast a bit, that actually increases your BDNF. Um, so your body actually doesn't like being overfed. Did you know that? Over, over, overeating shortens our lifespan dramatically. If you want to increase your longevity, you should engage in regular fasting. Um, obviously, considering your individual physiology and where you're at and whether it's safe for you to do so, but fasting actually increases your longevity or caloric restriction, minimizing the amount of calories you take in. Being, being, not being obsessed about it, but being aware that you shouldn't be taking in excess calories. Eat, overeating literally shortens your lifespan. And um, one of the things that fasting does is it boosts this brain fertilizer, BDNF. Um, so if you want to stay smart, do some fasting and do some exercise. 
um, <clears throat> and avoids damaged cholesterol. What do I mean by that? We said the other night that the relationship between the fat that we take in in our diets and our cardiovascular risk is not a, is not a linear relationship. So it's not fat intake equals heart disease risk. It's not like that. There's other factors. And we said that it is important to control your fat, but it's the type of fat and also the inflammation that's causing the heart disease. Remember we spoke about that? <clears throat> so, there was a guy by the name of Bruce Taylor, um, and he did an experiment. They, they basically, his students wanted to test this hypothesis of, of fat on some monkeys. And he had a bucket of cholesterol in his lab. And they fed the, the monkeys p this cholesterol that had been sitting in the lab. And within, apparently within days or something, they were developing heart attacks and strokes. Uh, poor monkeys, eh? And um, so he thought, well, that's a bit strange. It seems a bit fast. It, it's faster than anticipated that they develop cardiovascular disease so quickly from this cholesterol. And he asked about the source of it, and it came from this bucket that had been standing open. And um, they repeated the experiment with pure cholesterol that hadn't been exposed to the environment. It hadn't had a chance to oxidize. And they didn't get that degree of cardiovascular disease. It was much less. So the kind of cholesterol that's really damaging our arteries and increasing our cardiovascular risk is oxidized, inflamed cholesterol. Um, and you know what really, so, so which, which foods are full of potentially oxidized cholesterol? Now, where, where, where's a good source of cholesterol that we put in foods and baking things? Eggs. Eggs. So what do we do when we make pancakes? We beat what? Eggs and sugar, flour. We're beating these eggs. And sugar, flour, sh sugar, cholesterol and, and the, that is beaten in air you're damaging that cholesterol, isn't it? So some of the worst things for you are custards and, and mixes that combine sugar and cholesterol because you're taking in damaged cholesterol. Um, does that make sense? Pa Sorry? How do I eat my eggs? If I have eggs, I would probably have a boiled egg. Um, it's a safer way to have it. Um, or medium poached eggs, you know. Uh, but if you're going to scramble your eggs and beat them in air, um, you're going to damage the cholesterol more. Makes sense, doesn't it? So, um, so successful weight loss. This is something that many of us need. Um, we eliminate snacks. We all snack. Uh, we're not made to constantly snack. Though a lot of popular opinion advises the contrary. Um, it's often our snack foods that actually are the most calorie dense and nutrient poor. Uh, and those kind of foods actually put the weight, pack the weight on. So avoid snacking. Drink only water between meals. Remember we said it's a good principle to, to only drink between meals, not with your meals, because that affects your digestion, doesn't it? So if you're diluting your digestive enzymes, your hydrochloric acid, your pancreatic enzymes, you're affecting the quality of your digestion and your nutrient absorption. So drink water between meals. And just while we're on that point, juicing I believe is a very good thing to add to your health regimen, what we're doing here. But one thing you must remember is that I, I feel, based on sugar control, I think it's better to juice your vegetables and eat your fruit. Because when you juice fruit, when you juice fruit, you're taking out the fiber. You're getting sugar. You're getting the sugar without the stuff that it's needed for digestion. So my advice is if you're going to incorporate juicing in a regular part of your health program, and I... I'm trying to with my life. It, it really does make a difference. It's, it's a really good addition to your nutrition. But try and juice the green veg. So cucumber, celery, spinach, um, all the green stuff that's the low carbohydrate vegetables. If you're going to juice stuff, make it the low carbohydrate veg. The low carbohydrate, high water content veg. Broccoli doesn't have a lot of water in it. If you try and juice broccoli, you're going to see one little drop of green come out. If you try and juice a cucumber, you'll see a whole lot of fruit come out because uh, cucumbers are high water content, low carbohydrate vegetables. So cucumber makes, cucumber, celery, spinach. Spinach also doesn't have a lot of water content. But, um, so think green, think vegetable, and rather eat your fruit. I'm not saying you can't add like half an apple or you know, half a lemon, but the balance of it should be green veg. Does that make sense? Because you, otherwise you're going to upset what? Your blood sugar control. So you're going to spike your sugar, which means you're going to spike your... 
insulin. And we said that one of the ways to keep healthy is to keep your insulin low. So try and juice your vegetables and eat your fruit. Uh, so successful weight loss. If we want to get our weight under control, we want to eliminate snacking. We want to drink w only water between our meals. Don't drink fruit juices and, you know, we get liquid fruit and all these lovely juices, but they're full of sugar. They've got no fiber in them. If you have fruit juice as a treat, as I say, dilute it. Go like a 50-50 mix. But don't drink neat. Don't drink fruit juice neat. It's full of sugar. Um, good breakfast, moderate lunch, no evening meal. Remember, it's often the evening meal that sits on the hips and the stomach. Because we're not using it. And often, what do we feel like when we get home? We feel like dessert. And dessert is full of sugar. What does sugar do? Sugar spikes your insulin. And what does spiking insulin do? It does. It makes you fat. And what else? It actually switches off your growth hormone. So if you're trying to grow your muscles and get big, one of the things you should not be doing is having carbohydrates at night. Because the insulin actually inhibits your growth hormone production at night. So if you're really hungry, really hungry and you haven't eaten well and you absolutely must have something, take some celery and put some almond butter on it. As lovely as that sounds. <laughs> or have a, prote have a, have a couple, of, couple of almonds or, or something with protein in it. Some, some soy milk or rice milk. Um, well, a lot of that will have carbohydrate in it. But you want to focus more on proteins at night. Carbohydrates switch off your growth hormone production. And growth hormone declines as we age anyway. You want to keep your growth hormone high as long as possible. And you especially want it at night to repair your tissues and to, and to, to heal. Um, and not to let the stuff sit on your stomach and hips, because that's what's going to happen when we eat at night. Um, eliminate foods that are high in sugar and fat. Get fiber. Um, at least 45 minutes of meaningful physical exercise. And that's not getting the remote, we said the other day. That's meaningful exercise. Best brain foods, positive stuff. Blueberries have been called brain berries. They're just so good for your brain. The problem is this, their price. <laughs> Maybe I can encourage someone here. Start growing blueberries and sell them cheaply to us, please. There's a, there's a market for it. I will be at your door buying your blueberries. These things, if you can get two cups of blueberries in your day, you'll do your brain wonders. It's a powerful antioxidant. These things are amazing. They're called brain berries. Um, cruciferous vegetables, they keep coming up, don't they? The Brussels sprouts, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the cabbage. That stuff is superfood, superfood. I've been talking about it for too long. I've got to get a pot of Brussels sprouts going at home. It's good food. Garlic, green leafy veg, um, nuts, olive oil, pomegranate seeds, um, tomatoes, whole grains. These are the good brain foods. You mean things like peanuts? Yeah, I'm talking more things like um, macadamias, almonds, pecans, walnuts, yes. Yeah. Look, a lot, of, a lot of the peanuts, peanuts can be fine, but a lot of them have a high degree of mold and stuff on them, for instance, as well, which some people struggle with. But you know, the be better quality nuts are the ones I've mentioned. They are okay, yes. But as I say, some of them, sometimes they often have a lot of mold on them. Um, but yeah, it's, other than that, I'm, I'm not aware of many other problems with them. But certainly the nuts that we definitely know to be really healthy are the ones I've mentioned. Um, Meat-based diets um, are high in a, in a compound called ar arachidonic acid, which is pro-inflammatory. It decreases the synthesis and storage of acetylcholine, which is one of your neurotransmitter, um, which is one of your memory neurotransmitters in the parietal lobe. Meat-based diets increase your risk of cancer. They often come with parasites. They and can result in calcium loss. Um, so your body's maintaining a balance um, of its pH. The principal way that it maintains its pH balance is what? Through your lungs and your kidneys. So your body has a buffering system in your lungs and kidneys. One of the gases we spoke about the other night was carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is used by the body as a buffer because it's blown off and it decreases your acidic level by being blown off. Um, so, why I'm saying that is your body's maintaining your pH balance pretty well, and it does so using various ions to do that. Um, and the food we eat leaves a residue after it's metabolized, and vegetable or plant-based foods leaves an alkaline residue. Animal-based foods often leave an, leave an acidic residue, okay? The body's very good at balancing that. It's not like you're going to die in an instant if you eat something that's more acidic. 
But the point is, what's the net residue and what's the sum, the average that you're creating? And so the more, the more the average acidity of your diet, the more you lose calcium from your bones. So osteoporosis risk can be associated with high-protein diets and high-meat-focused diets because they're creating a net acidity and a net decrease in your alkaline mineral ash because your body uses those ions to buffer the acidity. It uses calcium. Calcium is part of the alkaline buffering mechanism of the body. So the more acidic we, of a diet we follow, which is, as I said, tends to be more animal-focused, the more we are acidic and the more we lose our alkaline reserves. And one of those things is calcium. So, um, what is killing us? Try not to read ahead. What is killing us? Cardiovascular disease and cancer. These are the two leading causes of death in the first world. Um, why are we getting cardiovascular disease and cancer? Is it because we are deficient in meat or fat? It doesn't sound intuitive, does it? We're not getting those diseases because we are deficient in meat or fat. <laughs> if you hear where I'm going with that. Okay. Um, no, the reason, the, re the reason we're getting, clearing some bugs from the nasal passage, it's good. Um, be because we're eating calorie-dense, nutrient-depleted foods that are low in antioxidants and protective compounds. Where is the protective benefit coming from? Plants. So the reason I believe we're getting these diseases is not because we're meat deficient or fat deficient, but because we're plant deficient. So if you want to be alive, you need to eat life. If you want to have life in your cells, you need to eat living food. And meat is dead food. As much as you might want to put it otherwise, it's dead food. Where did the cow get its buttocks from? It got it from the grass, didn't it? So we're eating processed secondhand nutrients, and, and that food is dead. Um, so the, if, you, if we want life, we need to eat living food. The more plants we incorporate in our diet, and the more alive plants we incorporate, the better our health is going to be. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a balance, it's an equation that's happening, is that how much of the good stuff are you putting in and how much of the bad stuff are you putting in? Or the less good stuff sometimes. Yeah, um, I believe there's, there's a real place for raw. As a lot of raw is, can be good. There's certain veg which are better cooked, things like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. You have to cook those things or steam them. Um, some of the, the, the beneficial compounds are best released after steaming. I think with Brussels, broccoli, broccoli it is. They say that after, I read the other day, after 90 seconds, you release some of the really beneficial compounds, which are the R3C compounds and the sulforaphanes and all those things, the protective compounds, are released by light steaming sometimes. But there's certain things that are fine to eat raw and, and are good to eat raw. Because remember, the more you cook something, the more you destroy the nutrients, generally speaking. But it's very hard to eat a raw potato, isn't it? Um, there's, some things, there's some things that have to be unlocked, and, and so one needs to use it. But the stuff that is good to eat raw, it's, it's quite intuitive. I mean, you can eat tomatoes, you can eat celery, you can eat... You know, there's, there's a whole host of them, and, and you'll know. Um, but yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, if the, the point is the more you cook something, the more you are losing the nutrients. You lose a lot of the essential stuff. So the, the more stuff, the more raw you can incorporate in your diet, the better. Remember, remember the foods coming from the ground, and unfortunately, a lot of the time... Exactly. A lot of the time it's been sitting on a shelf forever. If, if the ideal is to have your own little vegetable garden and grow some stuff as well if you can. But um, we can do the best we can, you know. But the benefit, the protective compounds are found in the plants, and I want you to get that message. Um, meat doesn't have antioxidants that are going to protect you from cancer. It's plants that protect you. Um, a guy by the name of T. Colin Campbell did a, a study in China called the China Study. You heard of it? And he did, it was the longest, the largest epidemiological study done of the impact of diet on lifestyle diseases. And it's, I can't remember how long it took, but it was a profound study. Did you know, Brian? Yeah, it was several years, eh? And they found that dietary protein affected cancer risk dramatically. So the kind and quantity 
of protein that we're including in our diets is dramatically affecting our cancer risk. And changing the level and type of protein turn cancer on and off. Casein, which is the protein where? Where do you find casein? Casein is the dairy protein. Casein promoted all stages of cancer, and soya did not. These are profound findings, aren't they? Um, so, what it's saying is the kind of protein we choose to use, the quantity of that protein, is affecting our risk of certain cancers. For men, casein was quite highly correlated with prostate cancer. Um, but it actually it said for all types of cancers, which is quite profound. Um, dietary animal protein increases production of acids in the blood, which can be neutralized by calcium, so we said that already. Consumption of dairy products, particularly at age 20, were associated with increased risk of hip fractures. Metabolism of dietary protein causes increased urinary excretion of calcium. Um, well, dairy is the source of casein. So you don't, you don't need dairy to be healthy. Well, butter's still got dairy in it. Yeah. We can talk about the specifics. I'm just talking about the actual protein itself now. But casein is found in dairy. So the, the point I'm trying to make is the better sources of protein for our physiology are actually plant-based sources. That's the point of the slides. Because the, the type of proteins that are found in animal products are associated with greater lifestyle risk. Um, so, benefits of plant-based diets. Are you still with me? Is this interesting? Are you happy? Not happy? You want to stop? Is it quarter to eight? Are you tired? Reality check? <laughs> How much calcium? Garlic. Can, can we take the questions afterwards? I'll, I'll get back to that. But basically tell your friends, stop talking to you. No, no, no. It's, garlic's really good. It's, it's, it's very good stuff. It's hard to overdose on garlic. But you, your friends will tell you. Um, so some benefits of plant-based diets. Lower to plant, people that follow plant-based diets have low, lower total and LDL cholesterol. Um, they have lower heart disease mortality. They have lower BMR, BP, and cancer risk. Um, preventive potential plant foods. Fruits and veg and legumes and soy protect against cancer, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Um, this is quite profound. Where was it? Lacto-over-vegetarians had a 24% lower risk of, cor of um, coronary heart disease, followed by vegans who had a 50% lower risk of coronary heart disease. Um, <coughs> And it's not a simple equation. There's th other things to consider. But the point is of that, it's saying, generally speaking, the more animal products we incorporate in our diet, generally speaking, the higher our risk of cardio cardio cardiovascular disease. Now, these things are a continuum. They're not absolutes. They're a continuum. So, um, but this is what the research shows. Listen, look at this. Fruit and veg intake and risk of cardiovascular disease. Fruit and veg intake, 3 plus times a day versus less than once a day. If you had just three and above fruits and veg in your day, decreased stroke incidence by 27%. Stroke mortality by 42%. And that's a paltry amount of fruit and veg. I mean, we're supposed to have, like, they're saying like 10 servings of fruit and veg a day now. This is three. Decreased um, stroke mortality by 42%. Ischemic heart disease mortality by 24%. Cardiovascular disease mortality by 27%. All, all cause mortality by 15%. So, there's something in the plants. That's the message we're getting. If you want to be alive, you need to have plants. You need to eat plants. Um, diabetic risk. Again, there was an, an, a fairly convincing increase in your diabetic risk associated with the more animal foods that you incorporate in your diet. Vitamin D is an important nutrient to be on top of. We're looking at some other key nutrients. The best time to get your vitamin D, your exposure, five minutes, is uh, between 10 and 3 p.m. 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um, obviously, one's got to be aware of skin cancer risk, and I'm not saying you must go burn to a crisp, but if you, if you get 15 minutes, two to three times a week between those times, you'll probably get enough vitamin D um, because the, the UV light acts on your skin, on cholesterol, to make vitamin D. It's hydroxylated in your kidney and your liver to an active form of vitamin D, and vitamin D is essential for health, essential for good immunity, um, 
limits your cancer risk and all sorts of things. Remember, if you live above 40 degrees north and below 40 degrees south, vitamin D synthesis is absent during three to four months of the year. Um, I mentioned when I came back from the UK, my vitamin D level was 18. And it's supposed to be 70 and above for ideal health. Um, so how are we covering the sun? So, so sometimes we go in the sun, but we're so scared of skin cancer that we cover everything and we look like snowmen. And you're not going to get vitamin D like that either. You know, you've got this white stuff all over your face and come and you call your children, you rub it everywhere. But they need to get vitamin D as well. <clears throat> Today, while I was preparing this, it was a sunny day in Belito. I thought there's no way I'm going to sit indoors the whole time. And I took my computer and I sat out in the sun. It was just such a treat. Eh? Just take those opportunities. Because most of us sit indoors all day. We, we, we do computer work, you know, live in, under artificial lights. We never see the sun. Soy protein is rich in isoflavones and vitamin K. Um, okay, that's fine. This is interesting, just to finish off a few slides. Thinking about the amount of calories in your food, and the point I want to make here is we're heading into the territory of, of weight loss and insulin resistance. That's where we're going now with this talk. Um, 720 calories in that muffin. 720 calories in all that. Profound, isn't it? That's going to keep you full for quite a bit. That's not. <laughs> Listen to this. This is a bit of a mouthful, but I want you to understand this. This is now saying... A calorie is not a calorie is not a calorie. In a lab, that is true. But your body is not a lab. And if you take 720 calories of broccoli and compare it to 720 calories of, of Coke, it's going to affect you differently physiologically. And just follow this description with me. I found it on the net, and it's a lovely description of what happens. So now we're talking about the Coke. It's a popular soda drink they were talking about in the States called Drink Up or something, um, which is 46 teaspoons of sugar. Remember, we're talking about 750 calories, whether it's broccoli or the Coke. Your gut quickly absorbs the free, free sugars in the soda, fructose, and glucose. Because there's nothing now, there's no fiber in the Coke. The glucose spikes your blood sugar, starting a domino effect of high insulin, a cascade of hormonal responses that kicks bad biochemistry into gear. The high insulin increases the storage of belly fat, increases inflammation, raises triglycerides, lowers your HDL, raises your blood pressure, lowers testosterone in men, and contributes to infertility in women. Your appetite is increased because of insulin's effect on your brain chemistry. The insulin blocks your appetite control hormone leptin. So leptin helps you feel satisfied. Leptin is one of the hormones that helps you feel satisfied when you eat. When you get leptin resistance through lifestyle, poor lifestyle choices, you st stop getting satisfied, so you continue eating. So this refined carbohydrate is switching off your, decreasing your sensitivity to leptin. The, you become more leptin resistant, so the brain never gets the yeah, full signal. Instead, it thinks you're starving. Your pleasure reward center is triggered driving you to consume more sugar and fueling your addiction. The fructose makes things worse, goes straight to your liver where it starts manufacturing fat, which triggers more insulin resistance and chronically elevated blood sugar levels, driving your body to store everything you eat as dangerous belly fat. You also get a fatty liver, which generates more inflammation. Chronic inflammation causes more weight gain, diabetes. Um, anything that causes inflammation will worsen insulin resistance. Another problem with fructose is it doesn't send informational feedback to the brain, signaling that a load of calories has just hit the body. Nor does it reduce ghrelin, the appetite hormone that is usually reduced when you eat real food. So, that's what's happening when you eat refined calories. You're getting that sort of metabolic mayhem. Let's quickly look at the, the broccoli. To get 750 calories of broccoli, you need to eat 21 cups of broccoli. So that's the first problem. You're never going to get 21 bro cups of broccoli in. So, what is that, what's the message we're getting is that we need to be eating fiber-dense, calorie-low or low-calorie, nutrient-rich foods, as opposed to fiber-poor, calorie-dense, nutrient-poor foods. If I fill my stomach up with, and these are the reasons we're getting fat, these are the reasons we're getting insulin resistance, we're eating calorie-dense, nutrient-poor foods. And so they don't fill us up they don't have the fiber to retard the sugar uptake. So we're never satisfied. We're getting this metabolic disarray that's happening because they don't have the stuff that, that's needed to metabolize it. Whereas if you fill your stomach with Brussels sprouts or broccoli, 
you fill with a whole lot less because of the fiber. Does that make sense? So that's important. You need to be thinking, what I'm about to put in my mouth, how much fiber in it is, is it in it? And, and how much volume is it going to occupy in my stomach? And what, how quickly is it going to release its sugar content? Those are the kind of questions you need to be thinking about. Because failing to do so is causing the previous scenario. So, first, you wouldn't be able to eat 21 cups of broccoli because it wouldn't fit in your stomach. But assuming, but assuming you would, what would happen? They contain so much fiber that very few of the calories would actually get absorbed. So fiber retards, retards sugar release. Okay? So when you get a slow sugar release, you get a slow insulin response. So you don't get an insulin spike now because it's releasing it slowly, which is what you want. Um, there'd be no blood sugar or insulin spike, no fatty liver, no hormonal chaos. Your stomach would distend, which it doesn't with soda, because there's lots of fiber. Um, blood from carbonation, okay, sending signals to your brain that you're full. There would be no triggering of the addiction and reward center in your brain. You'd also get many extra benefits that optimize metabolism, lower cholesterol, reduce inflammation, and boost detoxification. The phytonutrients in broccoli boost your liver's ability to detoxify. Environmental chemicals and the flavonoid um, camphorol is a powerful anti-inflammatory. Broccoli also contains high levels of vitamin C and folate, which protects against cancer and heart disease. Glucosinates and sulforaphanes in broccoli change the expression of your genes. Remember we said that the food is information that your genes are reading. Changes the expression of your genes to help balance your sex hormones, reducing breast and other cancers. Um, some calories are addictive, others are healing. Some fattening, some metabolism boosting. That's because food doesn't just contain calories, it contains information. Every bite of food you eat broadcasts a set of coded instructions to your body. Instructions that can create a health or disease. What will it be? A double gulp or a big bunch of broccoli. <laughs> so while we become insulin resistant, just to finish off, this is, I really want you to understand this. This is very important. Calorie, we're eating calorie-dense, nutrient-poor foods, inactivity, inflammation. One of the theories of insulin resistance, which I know I've been sp speaking about it the whole time because it's that important and it keeps coming up. We get fat by this process of eating calorie-dense, nutrient-poor foods. There are other causes like hormonal as well. But... One of the theories is those fat cells get starved of oxygen, they die. When they die, they generate inflammatory cytokines, they cause inflammation. That inflammation causes, decreases your body's sensitivity to your insulin. So your body drives its insulin up. Driving insulin causes you to gain more weight. Getting weight makes you more inflamed. Inflamed makes you more insulin resistant. So you get into a vicious cycle. So you need to break that cycle. Um, I thought of this analogy today when I was thinking about it. The gate here, the sluice gate, when you open the dam to let the water out. That's the insulin. That's the receptor on your cell. This is where the cell's happening. Okay? So the problem with insulin resistance, because of those food choices, because of our inactivity, because of the interaction with our genes, we've blocked the dam sluice. That's been blocked off. So there's no, in, there's no glucose. Actually, actually, the water's the glucose. But there's no glucose coming into the cell because that sluice has been damaged by our lifestyles. Um, the solution, so what happens is the body makes more and more insulin to try and overcome the blockage, right? Like we said the other night. It doesn't make insulin bad. It doesn't make glucose bad. The solution is not to say, well, now, now glucose is bad, so no more glucose. The solution is reversing the factors that block the sluice. So, you know, patients, type 2 diabetic patients, they, they often get... Um, metformin, they get insulin sen uh, receptor sensitizers, and then when that fails, they can sometimes get drugs that try and boost their insulin production. But can you see how counterproductive that is? You're boosting the hormone that is actually causing the metabolic mayhem that's uh, trying to overcome this blockage. Now, there's, But you've got to balance that against the risk of having high blood sugar, because that's also about damaging your endothelium. So it can be quite tricky, but the solution is to, is to reverse the factors that are blocking your receptor sensitivity. So to lose the weight, to stop the inflammation um, so that the gate can open and then the insulin comes down. Sure, no, no. I mean, the point is when you've lost electrolytes, you do need to replace electrolytes, absolutely. And if you have severe dehydration, then the glucose drip has its place. You know, it's not... It's, I mean, there's, there's, there's rehydration solutions and there's rehydration solutions, but, you know, that's a separate topic. But to rehydrate properly, you do need glucose and you need electrolytes. Um, 
So if you're bad at geodrated, you will need that. Um, okay, so this is, this is a, a picture I just thought was useful. The idea is not to get us taking so many pills that that's what we look like. We, we, need, we, need, to be, we need to be living the lifestyle that, that creates our norm, it restores our normal physiology. Um, and that, that is found in the plants. And we can use appropriate supplementation on, a pr on, the, on, the, on top of lifestyle change. That's the message. So, we need to heal our gut. If you have a diseased gut, you've got an inflamed gut. If you've got an inflamed gut, you're at risk of insulin resistance. Um, choose whole plant-based foods. Whole plant-based foods, low caloric intake, nutrient-dense diet. We'll exercise, we're made to move. Move towards your ideal body composition. Know what your ideal body composition is. What, for your age and weight, what should be your fat composition? That's probably more important than, oh, I've only lost a kilogram today. Know what your ideal body fat composition is and choose a lifestyle that's going to help you move towards your ideal body fat composition by increasing your exercise, by controlling your carbohydrate choice, by eating whole plant foods. Don't, um, you don't incorporate refined calorie-dense foods in your diet. Um, and I think that's the last slide. So, unprocessed states, the life is in the plants. If we want life, we must eat life. Plants, let me tell you, green plants. Life is in the plants. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bruce. I think tonight we can have five questions. Is that all right? Sure. We usually have three but I think there's a lot of people that want to ask. Number one. You talk a lot about soy, um, soy uh, uh, beans and whatever. Yeah. Now, as far as I know, most soy is genetically modified. Can you talk to us about whether that's still beneficial to us or not? Yeah, look, I, I wouldn't by any means say I'm an expert on that. I would try to get the best quality soy you can that's not been modified, absolutely. To what degree that negatively impacts your health, I would have to read more, to be quite honest, um, to give a fair response. But I think it always makes sense to get food in its natural state. Um, you know, some, I don't think some modifications, Michiel, maybe you can help us as well. Um, I don't think some modifications make a massive difference, you know, always, necessarily. But if you can get a non-genetically modified bean, I'd rather choose that over a GM one. So I think it's probably going to depend on the product, what exactly has been manipulated as to its impact, but I couldn't say more than that at the moment. Okay, next question. What effect does the chemicals that go into the soil affect the, the vegetables that we eat? Yeah, fundamentally. So, uh, if, you, if you can get organic produce, and that's genuinely organic, then that's obviously far better for us. And you must remember, we, uh, our physiology is exposed to about 80,000 different chemicals these days. So we can't even assume that the vegetables we're eating are actually, you know, best, best for us. But the point is, sometimes we've got to choose between a chemical-laden vegetable and a hormone-laden steak. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So we do the best we can within the constraints, but if you can get the best for you is to get organic produce where you can, which is more expensive, grow your own at home, and if you can't do that, you wash what you get. Wash it as well as possible. There's certain things that, like cucumber. Cucumber's got a very waxy layer on it. Um, if you, you know, the, the peel, unfortunately, contains the good stuff, but it also contains the poison. So try and wash that off if you can. And if you can't, if you're worried about it, you can peel that you know, under exceptions. But absolutely, it's a problem. You know, it's, it's, it's a problem we have to deal with in modern-day living. You have to wash as much of it off as possible or get organic. Thank you. Uh, just a question on this side. Is anybody on this side with a question? Okay, no one, uh, anybody there? Okay. Um, are you aware of the IQ products for Amigas? Amigas? Yeah, oh, yeah. And what would you, what do you think of that? Yeah, well, as a principle, I think supplementing with Omega-3 is a very good thing to do, especially if you've got a demonstrated deficiency. But the issue is the source. And so, you know, the, the claim is made that a lot of these things are distilled to get rid of the mercury. Um, but... One of the guys I've been reading, he says that, that no fish oil product is essentially mercury-free, no matter how much you distill it. Um, so, is it good to supplement with, with omega-3? 100%, absolutely. 
what's the best source, that's what we can debate. So in my opinion, it's probably better these days to get a, a plant-based source of EPA and DHA. If, as I said, the first thing is to get it from the diet. So I think if you can include the seeds, like ground flax seed and stuff like that in it. Um, do you know how to make a good omega-3 mix? Does anybody know that? So flax seed, pumpkin seed, sunflower, and sesame seed. So if you... If so you write that down. Flax, flax seed, seed, pumpkin seed, sunflower, pumpkin, and sesame. Sunflower and sesame. Yeah. So you take, you take a cup of flax seed and a third of a cup of sunflower, pumpkin, and sesame seed. Got that? So it's two cups. So it's a, a, cup of, a cup of flax and a third of pumpkin, sunflower, and sesame. And you can, yeah, that's a different type of fat. Okay, a question on somewhere here. I saw a hand. But I just wanted to finish that thing on, okay. the, on the flax, on the, on, the, on the seed, sorry. And then you, you keep that in a glass jar in your fridge. And then you, for your porridge, you can just grind two tablespoons of that over your porridge in the morning. That's a good way to get your omega-3. So I'm point, the point is, get it from your diet first. If you, can, if you suspect deficiency, if there's a mental health condition, or if you suspect deficiency that you've tested and proven, then I would get another supplement. I'd try and find a vegan source if I could, an EPA and a DHA source. But you are getting the ALA as well, so that's probably the better way to go. But I, I believe, in principle, IQ is a very good product. I've got nothing against it, apart from the whole fish oil, plant oil debate. Sure. Okay, another question? Related to that, when you make up your omega-3 recipe, yeah. Yeah, you can put it in your smoothie. Um, and they argue that, you know, in, in the flaxseed, I was reading about it today, actually, they say that, you know, there's, there's been this... Actually, I don't want to go into that because it's going to confuse people. But the point is, you, the best thing is to mix, to mix it up. It, so it's, a third, it's a, two cups, a third of pumpkin sunflower sesame. Keep it in a glass jar. And when you, when you want to use it, you can grind it in a coffee grinder. I've got a coffee grinder at home. I just put two tablespoons of that. I haven't had it for a while. I've got to get back into it. But put it in your, put it in your grinder... Just grind it up into a fine powder. Remember, if it's really fine, it's easily absorbed. And you must keep it in the fridge. And you mustn't grind it in advance, because when you grind it, it oxidizes, and you damage the fat. So you must grind it when, you, when you're about to use it, and keep it in the fridge to preserve the, omega, the fats as stable as possible. Absolutely. Apart from... Apart from the stuff that they've been sprayed with. That's the caveat, is that you've got to give as much of that stuff off as possible. So if you, if you feel that you've got a product that you can't get all the junk off, then, then skin it. Because, yeah, there's various ways. I'm not a fundy on that. But the point is, be aware of the source. If you're at risk, try and wash it as well as possible. If you're overly concerned, then, then skin it. Yeah, some, look, some, some products absorb more stuff than others, like peaches. Peaches... You know, it's got a very porous skin, so it's, it's going to go straight through, you know. Whereas an apple is quite waxy, and, and you often find your apples are very waxy, and that's, that's got to be washed off. And unfortunately, berries as well, blueberries and strawberries, berries are so sprayed. They're such a chemical-laden product. But the point is not to get neurotic about these things. The point is that this is the world we live in. How do we live the best we can within the context of that, you know, and how do we minimize our risk of that? Okay, one more question. There we go. The potatoes right in the middle of the picture. Yeah. Are they carbohydrate or not too bad? Are they kiwis? Are they kiwis? No. But, but yes, I, I, I hear your question and I think I understand what you're asking. Um, I didn't want to get into this now, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a big topic. Um, it's a very contentious issue at the moment. Um, I believe, and this is my educated summary based on what I've been reading, I think if you incorporate whole foods into your diet and you follow these principles where you're not eating refined, calorie-dense stuff, you're exercising, you're controlling your portions, you're eating stuff that fills you up with low calories, I believe in that way you're going to restore your insulin sensitivity. Um, in which case, but I've, I've been in two minds about it. If there's a place to pops. Look, if you're trying to lose weight, you're going to decrease some of your starchy carbohydrate. You're going to. Um, I know this flies in the face of popular teaching at the moment, um, but I'm basing it on lots of reading and my personal opinion on, on how things, I think, work physiologically. And that's just my humble opinion. I'm saying it very humbly. I'm not saying it arrogantly. I'm saying if, if, if you decrease your caloric intake, 
decrease your refined stuff, lose the excess weight, control inflammation, um, stop eating processed foods, you will probably get back to your sensitivity. You can get back to your sensitivity. But, um, and, and then, so, but, but in that process, you're probably going to decrease some of your starchy stuff. So you're not going to have, it's probably going to be better for you in that process to have a plate that's full of colorful veg, like broccoli and Brussels sprouts, the lower sugar carbohydrates sources than a whole plate full of refined mashed potato. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So, so it's about trying to bring your body back to a sensitive state. And in that process, you might watch a bit more of the starchy stuff. Does, does that make sense? Thank you. If there's any more questions, there's a little blue box at the back. You just can jot them down. And um, sorry, I, I, I have to cut it. So you can just pop your questions in the blue box, and then Chris can tell us about the other things. Sure. Okay. So Kim's mentioned there is a question box there. Pop it down there. Um, there's also a prayer box at the back. Um, if any of you are, are really struggling with, with uh, wellness and health, uh, there's a prayer box at the back, and we do have a team of people that are praying specifically for you to help you uh, restore your health and your wellness. And then um, also th there was a request for donations. So if you would like to, to give a donation, and you're more than welcome, there's a donation box there um, uh, as well. Uh, what's that, the reception area there. Don't forget to register on your way out. And then um, just trying to read all the messages. Um, okay, the chair, the chair massages. So if you want a chair massage, um, if you've had one already, you know what it feels like. It's, it's good. So um, the chairs are set up around there and, and we're doing those. And then is the, okay, it's not on here. So the, the seminars are all being recorded. And they're on YouTube. So if you type into YouTube, Health Seminar 5, and then Kurt Conning, C-O-N-N-I-N-G, uh, you'll get tonight's lecture. If you do that tomorrow, you'll get tonight's lecture. And then 4 will be the last lecture, 3, 2, 1. Can I just say one more thing for tonight? I, I really want the take-home message to go home with you. And the take-home message is that we must be eating a diet that keeps our insulin low. We must be, and that comes in the, the best way to do that and to mitigate your cancer risk, to mitigate your cardiovascular risk. You want to be eating a low glycemic load, um, low calorie, nutrient dense, plant based, anti inflammatory diet. That's what you want to be on. I know that's a lot, but those are the, princ it's the principles. And the way you're going to get that is in the fruit and veg. Um, veg, sometimes more than fruit when you're trying to restore certain things, but fruit is also important. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Tomorrow night is metabolic health. So that's tomorrow night, same time, same place. Thank you, Chris. If you come 15 minutes early, you can also come for the chair massage. Okay, have a good night. See you tomorrow.